Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David Mackay from IBM Research. And today I'm going to talk about benchmarking near-term quantum computers. Uh, before getting into our processes and protocols for benchmarking, I think it's uh, important to motivate and contextualize by uh, mentioning some of the adva recent advances that have occurred in near-term devices. Uh, one of those advances has been the move towards uh, device systems and devices on, on a cloud platform. And what this has really allowed is standardized uh, access points to some of these devices. So, for example, at IBM, we have our uh, devices on our IBM uh, quantum cloud, but then we also have a software stack for accessing those devices that includes uh, standard, uh, standard interfaces to the devices for controlling the devices with uh, gates through open our open chasm protocol and through pulses via our open pulse protocol. And what this allows from a benchmarking perspective is to start to think about standardized benchmarking protocols that can be applied uh, across a number of different devices and a number of different device technologies even. And, oops, sorry. And as part of our QuizKit uh, software, the QuizKit Ignis package is our characterization uh, component. The other advance to mention is the uh, gradual evolution towards larger devices. So when we first put devices on the cloud in 2016, uh, we started with five qubit devices, and steadily that, that number has increased over time from 16 to 20, and now even 53 qubit devices. And so this, is ha this has created a particular new challenge for benchmarking protocols. We visualize our benchmarking efforts through this pyramid structure where at the bottom we have things like the device specification. So there we have a lot of information that we gather about the device, but it's very individualized. Uh, things like the coherence properties of the, of the individual qubits, the frequencies, um, things that are ma mainly static about the device and set mainly through fabrication and device design. And as we move up this pyramid, the benchmarking uh, information involves more and more qubits and becomes uh, more complex, but tells us more about the holistic nature of the device. So moving up from our device specification, we enter what we call subsystem benchmarking, and this is things like randomized benchmarking. And then finally, we go to holistic benchmarks which only give us a few, few uh, numbers characterizing the device, but they uh, characterize the holistic performance of the device, so the algorithmic uh, power of the device. And each uh, layer in this pyramid represents uh, a kind of a stopping point where we have to hit specific success metrics to continue uh, further up the pyramid. And in this, you know, this talk could, uh, of course, really be all about this pyramid and all the individual components. I'm, I'm just going to very briefly mention what subsystem benchmarking is, and then uh, in close, talk about some of our new results in holistic benchmarking. So kind of an overview, how do we get uh, operational information about our, about our device through this subsystem benchmarking? And what I, our goal, as I just said, we want to get optimal inf information that has some predictive power, but we can uh, obtain that information rather quickly so we can continually update it. And uh, IBM, much like a number of other groups, has really uh, leaned on this randomized benchmarking protocol uh, because it's uh, relatively quick and it's um, not sensitive to measurement and preparation errors. And as a reminder for randomized benchmarking, what we do is we select uh, a string of random Clifford gates here, L. Then we calculate the inversion gate, and that can be done efficiently because these are Cliffords. Then starting in the zero state, we apply this sequence to, a, to a, uh, the set of n qubits. Then we measure the polarization after the application of that sequence. And you can see for each individual random sequence, you get kind of a, a noisy distribution. But if you average over many random distributions, you get a nice exponential fit here. And that can be fit to uh, this exponential fit function, where the uh, fit coefficient is very uh, simply related to the average gate error. And when we say subsystem randomized benchmarking, what, mean, what we mean is we're going to run randomized benchmarking on a subset of, of qubits in the device. 
Typically, we want to run them on the subset of our native gates. So for our, our superconducting qubit devices, we typically have a native gate set of one qubit uh, gate operations and then two qubit gate operations. So we want to run subset randomized benchmarking on all those one qubit and two qubit uh, pairs where they have a gate in the set. And in fact, that's the type of information we return from a device when we characterize it. So here's a typical uh, characterization you get from one of the IBM uh, cloud devices. Here at the, oops, sorry. Here at the top uh, are some of, the spe some of the characterizations from that lowest uh, level of the pyramid, the device specifications. But then down here, we have the single qubit errors from randomized benchmarking and then all the two qubit errors from randomized benchmark. And again, you know, for, for this, this particular example, qubit three's single qubit gate error, that's done by applying this randomized benchmarking sequence and then fitting uh, a curve like this. And well, this uh, doesn't give like a, the full uh, process information like a process map would, this is still a very rich uh, set of information from the device and you can see, you can, uh, map this distribution of errors across the device and, and really get a feel for device performance. Here's uh, the 53 uh, qubit device and then a set of the 20 qubit devices. And what we can really see, even from this simple randomized, ben randomized benchmarking uh, metric, you can clearly see the improvement over time of the error distributions and, and the mean errors. But one of the questions that arises from these subsystem metrics, uh, how, op how really operational are they? They're, they're, they're a very good starting point for trying to make predictions about the device. But it's clear that in some uh, cases, the subsystem metrics are not enough to predict full algorithmic power. And that's why we move up one, up one more on the pyramid to look at holistic uh, benchmarks. And there's been a number of holistic benchmarks uh, proposed and demonstrated. For one, we can just take randomized benchmarking and instead of doing subset benchmarking, benchmark the whole device. Uh, we can look at cross entropy uh, metrics, algorithmic metrics. So people have looked at uh, VQE as a metric for the device. So if you do VQE on a known Hamiltonian, uh, entanglement metrics are also popular. Uh, but I, for the next, uh, for the end of the talk here, I'd like to talk about quantum volume, which is our holistic metric developed here at IBM. What is quantum volume? Well, quantum volume is a procedure to try and measure the largest effective uh, square circuit that you can run. The algorithm itself is that we, we split the algorithm into D, these layers here, and each layer consists of, consists of a completely random uh, SU4 gate, which so means a completely general and random uh, two qubit gate between a random set of two qubits, irrespective of the topology of the device. So represented here, these are uh, random permutations, but you can think of this as kind of a random SU4 between random two, a random pair of qubits. We do that in each uh, of these depth slices, then you're going to get a full n qubit unitary and then you compile that model circuit to your device based on your device topology. What is the success criterion of this algorithm? Well, you run this experiment, you, you, so you've generated some random circuit, you run it, you get a, a set of bit strings, and then you compare that to the classically simulated output, which should be perfect, and that's the ideal set of bit strings. And then you look for, for outputs which are so-called heavy, which means that those outputs where the probability of that output from occurring is uh, greater than the median uh, probability of an, of an output from occurring. Those are the heavy outputs. Once you've identified which, which outputs are heavy from the ideal distribution, you measure experimentally how many of those did I measure. So what fraction of the bit strings did I measure that were heavy experimentally? And the success criterion is that over two-thirds of what you measure are, are heavy outputs. And then quantum volume is simply defined, defined as two to the power of the largest number, the largest qubit subset where you still satisfy this uh, success constraint. What does that look like in the experiment? Here's uh, 
from a four qubits, if, well, after you do one depth uh, of the of the volume algorithm, you can see that the white bars, which are the ideal distribution, and the green bars, they're very heavily overlapped. Here, the experiment had a heavy output of 0.8. But then by f a depth four, these systems really de depolarize. The experimental distribution is basically flat, uh, and the heavy output is only 0.5. So this is kind of showing how the errors have uh, destroyed your ability to do that unitary. And to close the talk, I'd like to uh, mention our most recent results demonstrating uh, a quantum volume of 32 on one of our uh, new devices. And this, this work was done mostly by Peter Yurchevich uh, and should be in a forthcoming uh, publication. This is uh, uh, our Raleigh device. It's a 28 qubit uh, heavy hex device. Here are some, uh, some typical or uh, median and maximum coherence numbers. So m median coherence of 100 microseconds, maximum of 250. Here are some of those subsystem benchmarks from the device. Uh, two qubit, one qubit errors. You can see this is a, uh, sorry, backing up. This is the set of five qubits that we're going to demonstrate the device on. It's a linear, uh, it's a chain of five qubits. This is that the properties of the, that chain. And you can see that the errors are quite good. Um, some less than 1%, uh, fairly low uh, ZZ interactions between the qubits. And here's a crosstalk map of that, that uh, set pair, uh, that chain as well. Uh, and the crosstalk measures if I apply a drive to this qubit, what percentage of that drive ends up on the other qubit. And you can see that they're predominantly uh, lower than 1%. And then if we look at the actual quantum volume uh, numbers, well, here's some prior results on quantum volume from our other devices. And you can see only on this IBM Q system one, which is now uh, Johannesburg, you can get a, we obtained a quantum volume of two to the four, so 16. And then now our, now our most recent results on this Raleigh device, we can very clearly with some optim optimizing over our gates, we can get a very clear signature of uh, quantum volume uh, 32. And so I'd like to close on that and just mention if you want to try quantum volume on your own device, please uh, install QuizKit and check out the Qu QuizKit Ignis package. Uh, that's where you can, there's code in there to generate volume, uh, run volume, and fit those, fit volume so you can make uh, graphs just like this. All right, thank you.